Okay, I'd rather bury you. You are better of dead than for you to destroy my name like this. Says of Mugiwa. Hello everyone, welcome to ASR, African Stories Realized. This is our review of the Netflix documentary about the death of Senzo Meiwa. Senzo, murder of a soccer star. This is a very personal one for me as a soccer fan and an Orlando Pirates fan. I still remember where I was the day we lost Senzo and I'm sure many of you do as well. Let's get into it and see how Netflix honored his memory. First of all, great quality. The Netflix documentary team outdid themselves polishing up most of the old footage and interviews. I've never seen footage from almost 10 years ago look this clean. The documentary opens up with Robert Marawa's recollection of Senzo's final game and the country's reaction to his passing. I personally watched that game on TV and I have to agree with Robert Marawa that he had the game of his life under the heavy rain and floodlights that night. He played like a man possessed and no one was more confident than I that he would carry that form into the Soweto Derby the following week. Netflix did a really good job of cultivating all the interviews Kelly did talking about Senzo after his passing. Cause after a while she stopped speaking on the matter. I didn't even know that most of this footage exists. I do understand why Kelly wouldn't want to be involved in the documentary at this point for the privacy of her and her children but also because she's been labeled as a person of interest in the murder of Senzo Meiwa. And anything she says about the murder on public record can be used against her in court in the future. So she's simply avoiding self-incriminating herself during an ongoing investigation, even if she is not guilty. Kelly's entire family and Chico Twala's son are also absent from the documentary. On the other hand, Senzo's brothers, mother and other family members are in the documentary speaking their piece. But I think the most surprising inclusion for me was Senzo's friend, Tumelo, who was in the house with him when he died. I've never heard him publicly speak on the matter, so I was very interested to hear what he had to say after staying silent for almost a decade. Tumelo is introduced to us as Senzo's best friend. And I was surprised that after staying silent for all this time, he did not really share any new information and simply reinforced the story we've been fed this entire time. Netflix were also able to get former law enforcement officers who helped shed light on the case and the crime scene. Something that was disappointing for me to hear and what we often hear in South African crime stories is that the crime scene was disturbed and evidence was tampered with. Law enforcement has to be more responsible and take more accountability for all these corrupted crime scenes and tampered evidence. The most interesting bit of the first part of the documentary was when Senzo's brother, who's always been well spoken in the media, challenged Dumelo's account of the events that happened that night and even went as far as claiming that Dumelo may be implicit in Senzo's death or covering it up. The first part of the documentary also interviewed the facial recognition expert who interviewed the people that were in the house to compile the identikit of the suspected murderers. Shortly after that, a suspect was captured and held for three weeks before being released due to insufficient evidence. The man was also interviewed by Netflix for the documentary and spoke of the trauma he suffered because of this ordeal. He is currently suing the police for wrongful arrest and is seeking damages of 17 million. This man who was wrongfully arrested was apparently known to Kelly Kumalo and her mother as someone who occasionally washed Senzo's car. Dumelo also alleges that it was Kelly and her mother who identified this man and never notified the police that they knew who he was and wasn't the one who committed the crime. They allowed the police to hold an innocent man for murder. At this point, the documentary is beginning to put Kelly and her family under the microscope. The facial recognition expert alleges that Kelly had a negative attitude and body language during their interview and suggested that she suspected that something was fishy. She was very careful not to accuse Kelly of anything and just said that she felt that something was wrong and that the way she was behaving was not normal. But then again, if I have to play devil's advocate when you lose a loved one, what is normal.
But then on the other hand, people are expecting you to do everything you can to help find the murderers of your partner. It's a very tricky one and I'm looking forward to seeing how this Netflix documentary is going to find that balance. Another problem I have with these experts being interviewed for this is that it is an ongoing investigation so I hope it doesn't negatively affect Senzo's murder case and inflict on Kelly's right to legal due process. One of the first officers at the scene claimed that only one cell phone was stolen despite the suspect allegedly asking for all the cell phones. They only escaped with Kelly's cell phone. First part of the documentary ends when they allege that Kelly's neighbors heard commotion next door and alerted the neighborhood with a whistle. Allegedly, Kelly's son was left traumatized by the incident and may have witnessed something. But Kelly declined when asked if the child could be interviewed, saying it would be too traumatic for him. Whether or not the boy did witness something, I don't think that's too weird for a mother to protect her child in that way. We have to remember at the time the child was very young. And once anyone gives information to the police, they will have to do so in court as well. And I think that's too much to put on a child that age. The second part of the Netflix documentary starts with various testimonies of the conspiracies and controversies surrounding Kelly and her various relationships in the past. Marawa gives commentary on the last time he saw Senzo and Kelly together and the song she performed that night prophesizing the tragic events that would follow. Again, I have to say big up to Netflix for uncovering some of these files. I don't know who Kelly was telling her story to at Joe Burke's Lyrical Theatre in 2017 but it has to be the most candidly she's ever retold the events of that night and even confirmed that her son witnessed everything. The documentary then shifts attention to the feud between Kelly and the Meiwas following Senzo's death. We get a better picture of where Kelly and Senzo were in their relationship before he died as it appears they were shacking up together at Kelly's house. This means that when Senzo died a lot of his things were left in her possession and Senzo's father fought to have them return to the family. Kelly was definitely wrong to hold on to his belongings against his family's wishes and for allegedly not calling his parents to notify them that their son had died in her house. The documentary then shifts gears to explaining how the couple had met and how Senzo pursued her even though he already had a wife. Kelly claims that she only found out about the marriage after her pregnancy had been confirmed. Kelly also claims that Senzo had left his wife and moved in with her which I guess made her feel that the possessions they had together when he died were now hers the audacity. Senzo's friends though confirmed that Senzo was still appeasing his wife Mandisa the entire time he was dating Kelly. As they retell the events of the day leading up to Senzo's death, they claim that Senzo was supposed to meet up with his wife Mandisa at a party that night. So I believe the plan was to chill with Kelly and her family then go and join Mandisa and her friends later. Dumelo pretty much confirmed that Mandisa had been trying to call them and they overstayed at Kelly's house. At this point, he's pissing me off, especially when he says they couldn't leave the house and he can't tell us why. Ultimately, Senzo's friends and family would arrive at the hospital to the realization that he had met his end. The second part of the documentary ends with the retelling of Senzo's funeral and the finger pointing that would follow. The biographers being interviewed cast a shadow of doubt over Mandisa, Senzo's wife who they loosely named as a suspect. Now while I believe Mandisa had plenty of motive and her demeanor at the press conference with Ivan Koza was weird, I doubt she had the means or desire to pull it off cause Senzo was worth more to her alive than dead. The third part of the documentary picks up where the second one left off with the game of who done it continuing. In this part of the documentary, we finally get to hear from the other friend who was with Senzo the night that he died, Ntoko. Ntoko is introduced as a mutual friend of Mandisa and Senzo who spoke at Senzo's funeral and is the first person I heard on this documentary say he isn't allowed to discuss certain things regarding the case. That much I can respect and I think the information he gave us will prove to be vital. We meet Mtoko through interviews that were conducted by the author Soweto Mandlanzi who wrote the book about Senzo's life and who also finds it hard to believe that Senzo's so-called friends would participate in this cover-up. Part 3 then switches focus to the toxic love triangle between Senzo, Kelly and Mandisa. Basically, according to multiple sources, Kelly was supposed to be a one-night stand 
But Senzo's brother says Kelly kept coming back. Eventually, they fell in love and Senzo tried to put in motion the steps to taking Kelly as a second wife. Now, from what I gather, Mandisa and Senzo's family wouldn't accept this because Senzo had failed to introduce Kelly to the family in the proper way. Kelly's family had no objection to a polygamous marriage and Kelly being Senzo's second wife, but the affair they had made it impossible for Mandisa and Senzo's family to accept her. Part 3 of the documentary ends with focus shifting back to the people who were in the house that night that still refused to speak publicly on the matter, namely Longwe Twala. With Marawa explaining his erratic correspondence with Longwe Twala's team and his enigmatic behavior since that fateful night. A few years have passed since Senzo's death in part 4 of the documentary and Senzo's father is still fighting for justice for his son. This had to be the most interesting part of the documentary and we finally get a more believable version of what happened that night. The infamous Twitter account Man's Not Barry Root reported that Senzo was shot trying to protect Kelly and her sister Zandi from her boyfriend who had gotten aggressive towards her. Man's Not Barry Root reported that after Longwe Twala shot Senzo, the people in the house conspired to protect Longwe and cover up the true events of that night. This theory is reiterated by the fact that Senzo's sister claims that Kelly called her that night telling her that Longwe had shot Senzo as he tried to break up a fight. It was also reported that three of the people Kelly called after the shooting were Senzo's sister, wife and Longwe Twala's father Chico Twala. And this is believable because at this point Kelly's not sure if Senzo's gonna die and she is contacting everybody that she should be contacting. But then obviously things changed after Senzo passed and now it becomes a murder charge. Definitely if Senzo had survived it was something that could have easily been swept under the rug as an accidental shooting. But after the passing of a national hero, it became real. Now it also needs to be stated that Chico Twala produced Kelly's album and the song that is claimed to have prophesied Senzo's death. So if anybody sacrificed Senzo, it was him. The story gets deeper because apparently Senzo, Kelly, Zandi and him were having a couple's weekend rendezvous at one of Senzo's places and Senzo had given strict instructions not to answer Longwe's calls who had already been suspecting that his girlfriend was cheating. This makes sense for two reasons. Dumelo had just arrived the previous day from Umlaz so he couldn't have been the one that Kelly's sister was fooling around with. Two. Ntoko made a great effort not to be seen in any of the images that were taken the day of Senzo's passing. In fact, in one of the pictures, Ntoko claims that he purposely hid himself. This is what I mean by Ntoko actually did give us valuable information because he did a good job at showing us what motives were at play that day. Senzo's biographer, Soweto, confirmed that Ntoko spent the weekend with the couple and Zandi but claims he slept on the couch. We all know that's not true. The investigative journalist claims that after failing to reach his girlfriend for days, Longwe arrived at Kelly's home only greeting her mother and from there that's when things kicked off. It's all coming together now because personally I believe Chico Twala is a very influential man in South Africa and has been making money off music since the days of apartheid. The only reason everyone in that house would go along with this is money and intimidation. So maybe this documentary shedding light on Senzo's situation and the people involved speaking publicly will actually help them stay protected from those who are accused. Senzo's brother also claims that even after Senzo's passing, they would still hang with Mtoko and Tumelo. According to Senzo's brother, Tumelo always stood by his story, but when Mtoko was drunk, he would confess that Longwe is the man that killed Senzo. This was also reiterated by an anonymous interview from one of the first officers at the scene who claims that while they were at the scene of the crime the following day, Dumelo broke down and started confessing that Longwe was the trigger man. It was at this point that Dumelo was called back in by Zandi when they realized he seemed to be confiding in law enforcement. Dumelo regardless continues to be defiant and claims that no one in the house shot Senzo. From there, we hear from the alleged trigger man himself. Longwe Twala, who took to a radio station to defend himself against the mounting allegations, but he ended up doing himself more harm than good as he failed to get his story straight, which Netflix did a good job of highlighting. To his credit, Chico Twala went out of his way to defend himself in the media and did a much better job than his son did. 
Another interesting thing the documentary highlighted is that there are currently two separate teams working on Senzo's case, one of which is a cold case team, which for me is ridiculous. If you still have an active case open and a team working on it, it doesn't qualify as a cold case, and we've never given up on justice for Senzo. Sadly, in 2019, Senzo Meiwa's father would meet his demise before seeing justice being done for his son. His wife would confirm on the documentary that he died of a stroke, Marawa saying that he died a broken man. The controversial decision of the Meiwa family to seek assistance from AfriForum, who are seen as an anti-black organization in South Africa. But with the recent fanfare advocate Gheri Nell had received from persecuting Oscar Pistorius, it seemed like a desperate but obvious option for the Meiwa family. The fourth part of the documentary ends with the announcement that five suspects had been captured in connection with Senzo's murder. A lot to wrap up as we head into the final leg of the documentary. Since this is the last installment of the docuseries, I'll give my final verdict at the end of this video. Let's get into it. The last installment of the docuseries follows the story of the five men arrested for Senzo's murder. The suspects are allegedly notorious hitmen in the taxi industry, but they strongly deny committing the murder of Senzo Meiwa. I agree these men may be hardcore killers, but they have a clear MO. The murders they've committed are all linked in the taxi industry. Netflix did a good job of ensuring these men's voices were heard. Credit to them for giving the suspects' families an opportunity to represent them in this production. The suspects allege that one of them was offered 3 million to implicate them in this murder, with the only thing linking one of them to Senzo's murder being the murder weapon, which could have changed hands numerous of times throughout the years. One of the suspects' family members alleged that he was beaten and offered 100,000 to turn state witness and pin the murder of Senzo on the other three being framed. Senzo's brother Sifiso doesn't believe these version of events and terminated their relationship with Afro Forum because he didn't feel they were pursuing the truth, rather a quick verdict. Sifiso's family would go behind his back and reacquire the surfaces of Afro Forum. At this point, Senzo's case is being pulled in two different directions as the family, their legal teams and police investigating pursue two different truths. The story of the hitman continues because Senzo's family alleged that police assured them that the mastermind of Senzo's assassination would be arrested. The investigative journalist alleges that Kelly Kumalo was the one that hired the hitman and agreed it would be done for 250,000, a quarter million rand. This would be corroborated when the MPA accidentally leaked a charge sheet that implicated Kelly as a mastermind, requesting her phone. I don't know about this one, because police would have picked something up from Kelly's phone when they seized them the last time, shortly after Senzo's death. Unless this was a reference to the phone used as a decoy for the murder. The documentary wraps up under a cloud of uncertainty, as still no solid lead on who could have killed Senzo. Instead, the documentary did very well to balance all the stories, not to put too much blame on any specific suspect. It all comes down to which story you believe. Do you believe that it was just a robbery gone wrong? Do you believe Longwe Twala shot Senzo and it has been covered up? Or do you believe that Kelly or someone else hired Hitman to take Senzo out? Personally, I think there's only two stories to consider because the robbery gone bad story was either a lie told to cover up that Longwe shot Senzo or those events did happen in the process of the hit being carried out. I personally feel like the story about the hitman is too convenient. It's not a coincidence that the progress in the case was only made after Afro Forum and Harry Nell took over the case. It was a huge mistake for the Meiwa family to trust someone who'd worked closely with the police as a prosecutor for so many years. I believe that Afro Forum colluded with Saps and the MPA to try and sell the Meiwas and the police false justice by scapegoating these hitmen. And in the long run, it seems like Kelly is their prime target. Senzo Meiwa's murder trial continues today and I look forward to seeing how it will unfold. At this point, we're just left with more questions than answers, but I hope the reviews helped. This is ASR, thanks for watching.